Hey you guys, thanks for clicking on this video. I appreciate you joining me. And in this video I'm going to get into something um, that might be um, triggering to some people. So I just want to let you know that right up front. Um, I've never really um, just talked about this as openly as I'm going to do in this video. A lot of people know about it, a lot of people I grew up with, um, a lot of people in my life, but as far as me just ever making a video about it or really just putting it out there in perspective, this is the first time for that. Um, so I just want to let you know up front, um, there may be some triggering things in this video if it's going to, if it starts affecting you in any way or, you know, making you feel some type of way. Please stop the video or do whatever you need to do. I understand that. And in no way do I want to trigger anyone or make anyone, you know, upset. But um, my videos are just for educational and entertainment purposes only. I have to put that little disclaimer in there. These are just my personal experiences and how I coped with the situations. Um... I'm kind of in my storage closet area, makeup area, and my son is here, and I'm trying to have some privacy back here, and my neighbors live right on top of me, and they can hear everything I say, so it's hard to do videos, it's hard to have any privacy, often I do them in the car for that reason, anyway, so, um, where do I start? <laughs> It's like, it's like, um, my story is almost one of those stories that it's almost unbelievable. It's almost like, what? When you hear it. But come to find out, more people than you would ever imagine have been through some kind of childhood, either physical or sexual trauma. Mental, emotional, physical, sexual abuse or trauma. And a lot of them sexual and a lot of people carry that stuff all of their life with a lot of shame, a lot of fear. Um, but yes, it's crazy to me when I find out how many people out there have had such an incident happen. And that, you know, we're really not alone with it. Now, each individual story is unique. Yes, in its own way. They all happen differently. The approach was different. Therefore, the child who grows up, that human being is going to be different. They're going to all operate differently. Not all trauma survivors are the same. and They don't all operate the same. So, anyway. So, in this video, I'm going to tell you guys about how... Um, basically, I sent my own father to prison. Um, it was because of me that he went when I was 15. Um, and uh, how I have coped with what happened in my childhood, you know, how I've navigated that. Um, basically, I feel like I, I really was. I was born into born into a family of abuse, trauma, dysfunction, boom, my earliest memories, okay, my earliest memories, unfortunately, are, I can remember being three years old, and very blurry memories of my father being drunk, and being in his bed, and him touching me, and I barely remember it, and then my mother told me, that I came to her and I said something to the effect of daddy sex me. Then I re vaguely remember my mother taking me somewhere and I remember playing with dolls at someone's office, which is what they have children do when they can't talk, they can't articulate what happened. They will have them come in and do play therapy. And these are my er these are my earliest memories. Those two memories, very vague and blurry. I remember playing with the dolls and a person saying some things to me. And my third earliest memory, the only three memories I have from being 
before talking age or right at starting to talk, somewhere between two and three years of age. Um, I remember laying on my mother's bed at one point and hearing my parents talking and, and I didn't really hear yelling, but children can really sense things. It's weird. I sensed that there was something terrible going on. I had this frightful feeling of just being, you know, helpless because I was hell. This could have been before the age of three. Hell, this could be two, two and a half. I don't really remember exactly, but I just remember I couldn't get up. I was on her bed. I was helpless, defenseless, couldn't really do anything. And I remember just being frightened and feeling a very dark, negative energy. And then I remember my mother finally coming to me and putting her hand on me and handing me a bottle. And I just, I will never forget when her hand touched my body, all fear, all pain, that all that horrible feeling just went away. I don't know. It could have just been from being a baby and babies are scared when they want their mother. And most children don't have memories before the age of three. Generally, we don't of being in a baby consciousness and wanting, you know, your mother to come and comfort you and how, what it feels like to just be a nothing. <laughs> but that's kind of what that was. Okay. And those are my first three memories in this life. Two of them were to do with abuse. And the other one was the comfort of my mother's hand and how it took all other pain away, fear, everything. Um, it was so comforting. And that's how I know, you know, that reinforcement of, oh my God, how important a mother's touch is, how important love and nurturing from our own mother really is for our life. Unfortunately, after that incident with my mother, I don't have any more mem memories of her comfort. I have no more memories ever in my life of her hugging me, touching me, kissing me, nurturing me, comforting me. None. For her, it was almost like once you were out of the baby stage, you're just a, an annoyance. So, um, both of my parents were narcissists. Both of them abusive. Both of, both of them had their own issues in their own damn ways. And not getting any help or therapy for any of it and having a bunch of kids. My mother had a child at 17. My older brother, 13 years older than me, by my father. My father went away for 13 years, got married two other times, had more kids, and then ended up coming back to my mother when my older brother was 14, having me and five more of us. There's a total of six of us with my parents. The older brother split out, never came back. He did not live in the house with us. I was the oldest at home three brothers under me and one little sister who came much later on who's eight years younger than me so that's how that went my parents were very abusive both of them in their own ways and it wasn't until child protective services scan that's what they called it back then in our state was scan it wasn't until um, people started making reports because we were going to school with bruises um, my grandmother lived right next door to us. She was always very frightened um, of my father. The violence, the yelling, the beatings. My mother was being beaten. She was afraid. Um, my father was an alcoholic. He drank a lot. And he was very, very violent. My mother was also violent in her own way. She would hit, slap. She was very cold. Aloof kids were just a, a, a fucking annoyance to her. There were so many of us, yet she just kept having them and having them and having them, like some prize to offer up to my father. I don't know, but just to give you some context on my parents before I get into what happened with my father going to prison. Um, there are two different extreme personalities. My mother, a very cultured person, intelligent, educated. Um, she came from a somewhat affluent background. My grandmother was a teacher. My maternal side of the family, all I had was my grandmother. No real relatives on that side. 
Mother was an only child. Father died at two years old. Apparently, when she had her psychological evaluation, we were told that she was schizoid personality, which I don't even know if that's currently in the DSM. I think it's in older versions, but anyway. My mother has a very odd, detached, cold personality. She does show love, but it's in different ways. She would never come right out and say, I love you. Terrible time with intimacy. Terrible time with vulnerability, with emotions at all. Um, But she would do little things for us to show love. You know, she wasn't what I would call just over-the-top cruel, but she wasn't loving either. She was not nurturing, comforting, any of those things like a mother. Very cold, very withdrawn. She was enduring a lot of abuse with my father. There were a couple times that she tried to do something about it, but there were so many of us to take out to a shelter. I guess she just felt trapped in it. And she didn't want to leave him. And she had battered women's syndrome and all these things. So basically she turned a blind eye to the abuse going on in that house for years. And she just dealt with it. And let us deal with it. Now my father, on the other hand, while he was violent, raging, he would come in and he was very controlling, very smothering. His narcissism was something different. Mom just didn't give two shits, it seemed like, you know, just cold, detached. But my father's narcissism was different. He would use us to get his needs met, his ego, his whatever. He was sexually violating me from my earliest memories. Um, Very smothering, very controlling, very jealous of me. He would... One minute be violent and raging and tearing up everything I loved, everything I had. Um, And the next minute, he was also loving and nurturing and comforting like a mother would be. He's also very mothering. So it's the only love we got. We didn't feel that from our mother. Whereas she would attack with, you little fucking maggots, you little fucking bastards, he wouldn't do that, not to my oldest brother and I, the, the oldest boy in the home right under me. There were three boys under me. My brother and I that were close in age, the two oldest at home, we were my father's favorites, like his golden children, basically. The two younger boys, they got even more extreme abuse, and on top of it, alienated, ridiculed called names by my father. Okay, so so my father had that mixed personality of violent, raging, beat the hell out of you. Sometimes I'd be dragged out of bed in the middle of the night. He's beating me drunk or he's beating my brother black and blue just because he's drunk and angry. We don't know why. My mother, I mean, sometimes she would scream and yell and try to get him to stop. Other times just... It just didn't stop. It just it just kind of went on. And my grandmother's living next door, and she's terrified. And she's communicating all of these things to my very oldest brother, who is now in his mid-20s, approaching 30, whatever. He's a lot older. He's living with his wife. They're all very concerned about the children living in the home with the parents and what can they do about it. They went through a lot of mental agony for years wanting to get something done about my father and get us all some help. My grandmother would take notes constantly, little scraps of paper, things that she would hear or see, or that we would act out in front of her. But it was very difficult back then. People just didn't know what to do. Um, Anyway, so again, my dad had this really mixed personality. He could be very manipulative. He gave me special favors. He treated me differently than the other kids because he was violating me. And this started at an age where for a long time I didn't know it was wrong. I thought everybody did it. Um, And so, yeah, he would buy me my favorite things. He would give me special favors. He would get violent and beat the hell out of me sometimes. But, and he was also, you know, sexually molesting me. I had to go to school the next day. I couldn't get any sleep. I would be awakened, and then if I would, like any normal child, if I would get upset and (laughs) I'm trying to sleep, you know, if I would complain, he would get very angry with me. He wouldn't beat me for that, but he would basically pout. You know, there's this big 
over 200 pound grown man and I'm a little girl and he would pout or well if you're gonna be that way then he would make me feel terrible like I'm a horrible child that whole manipulation thing and so yeah I mean I just had whatever I was a kid that's where you're gonna get Stockholm and trauma bonded and you're going to learn it that's where the programming starts that you are to obey you are to obey and you are to do what the alcoholic says what the abuser says this is where that training starts and conditioning in childhood and if you don't get help for it as you grow up you will attract the same type of relationships and in fact I did for a long number of years and I'm still working on those things to this day this is how deeply this type of trauma was ingrained in me and affected me okay so but because of my father's mixed personality he's the only one in the house with power you're a kid you love your parent no matter what and he has all the power I didn't like staying with my mother anytime my dad left I wanted to fucking go with him because my father again he also had he he drank he was like a big child he bought the candy bars he listened to the pop music he he was like a big kid I did not like being abandoned by my father even though he was the fucking abuser mm -hmm. and so there's some context about what the air was like in my family kind of um, I remember the first time my father ever gave me alcohol and started trying to make me his drinking buddy I was about nine and he started handing me vodka and so um, it's like um, it's like I've been at war it's, it's like I've been at war since day one I was born into having to be at war with narcissists predators criminals people gaslighting lying secret keeping all of that fucking conditioning and I had to have a lot of therapy for it okay and so um, I'm trying to think is there anything else I need to tell you about the early part but around 12 okay I remember being 11 and I had been being molested by my father all these years and thinking never thinking twice never questioning it never going to school and even the thought hadn't even occurred to me that maybe this doesn't happen to them or this that and the other I do remember feeling you know different as a child ugly stupid like I didn't fit in I was made fun of my clothes were ugly we were poor all that kind of stuff you know but I may have to make a part two to this okay because this this is kind of hard for me it's kind of hard for me but I need to do it because you get to an age where you just don't give a shit anymore you're gonna live your life you're gonna do you you're done protecting people you're done letting people trample on you you're living your purpose you're doing your spiritual and emotional work and whatever that takes you're done protecting people's nasty secrets you're, you're done keeping all that shit inside you you want to touch base with who you really are what you've gone through why you're here and how to continue healing and growing and I feel like it's important for us to do that not everyone is going to want to share it publicly not everyone is going to put that out there or be comfortable doing that and that's okay if you're not but I knew years ago that I wanted to do something with all of this inside of me because I've had to survive so fucking much and um, I knew that at some point I was gonna want to share it with other people in some way shape or form that have felt like me that have gone through similar things that might be still struggling with it and just let them know there is hope there are some bright sides and some healing and some overcoming and I have had to turn this whole thing around to my advantage and learn to heal myself and learn to do the best that I can even productive things with the cards I've been dealt okay so but yeah I'll probably follow up with a part two on this after I get most of it out 
I'll go back over it, and I'll come back with a part two and fill in the blanks. Anyway, so, <clears throat> I am going to be 46 in a month, and it's been a long road. It's been a long road, and when something like this happens to you, everybody's case is different. Some people were, you know, the approach was different. They were more, um, it was way more violent than what I got. You know, sometimes to this day, I'm so thankful to God that certain things inflicted on me weren't as violent as they could have been. In fact, looking back on a lot of parts of my childhood, I should have been dead by now. I fully believe that I've always had angels with me. I'll get into that in another video about my spiritual life. I've always had a very rich spiritual life since I was a child. I've always believed that I've had some kind of guardian with me, always watching me, always guiding me. As an abused kid, especially out in the streets, you have to develop kind of a sixth sense. You have to, um, in order to survive. So, anyway. <laughs> so, starting around 11 years old, after all this was going on, my mother never knowing any different. She'd be down there asleep, passed out. She didn't do drugs or alcohol, but she was just always out of it. Just aloof, just checked out, whatever... I guess because she had been enduring so much abuse and shock herself. And I got to be about 11 years old. And, you know, I was becoming grown for my age. My thinking, my whatever. I had already been drinking alcohol, vodka, because my dad was giving it to me. Um, and getting close to junior high age, you know, I started hanging out with some kids and kind of coming into my own thoughts and I remember I was like I became best friends with a young girl and she was living with her father her father was a single father she had no mother and that really provoked the thought in me of I wonder if her dad does this that was my first thought I grew up thinking this is normal this is this is what dads do So I asked my dad, I said, I'll protect her name, I'll just call her Jane. I was like, Dad, do you think Jane's dad does this? You know, because I was like starting to get brave enough to like, in, in my little small way, to even dare to express discomfort or protest. Because he was so violent and so hair trigger, okay? So, that was my way of kind of being like, you know, <laughs> I'm getting fucking tired of this. I was starting to get old enough to where these thoughts were coming to me. And he told me, yeah, probably so. Yes, he probably does. And that was it. He didn't go any further. He didn't elaborate. That was all he said. Okay. But somehow... I already was catching on that, uh-uh. And I, have not, I had not told anyone. I had not told a friend. I had not told a grown-up. I had not told anyone. But somehow, in the back of my mind, I was starting to just know, nah, you're full of shit. You're full of shit. I was starting to come into my own a little bit, you know. And we had cable back then. <laughs> my parents didn't censor a lot from us. We had... I had, we all had televisions in our room. We didn't have cable in our rooms, but my parents had cable. So we could watch cable and movies, and my mom didn't censor the F words. We could watch all that stuff, you know, and, and, and learn a lot from the television. Um, what was that case of the little abused girl? And it was one of the most horrific cases of abuse. I forget her name. Turpin. Lauren. Lauren Turpin. One of the bravest little girls. And in some ways, she reminds me of me. Not to minimize her case, because her case was so much more horrific than anything I was enduring at my house. Even though my shit was horrific and abusive. Her brothers and sisters, she and her brothers and sisters, it was the most horrific case of child abuse I think I've ever heard of. And she getting brave enough to escape out into the night like she did... And go make that phone call and bring the police to bust her parents' ass. Go, Lauren. 
Like that just, I just ran across her case last year and it just made me cry. It made me cry, but I know that spirit girl. I know that spirit cause I was that girl. Yep. I had that same spirit and that's what I did. Exactly what I did just in a different way. Okay. So when I got to be about 12 and I hit junior high, oh, things really changed. You know, a narcissistic abuser will try to keep a tight rein on their family. We were very isolated. No friends. No one in. No one out. I would have to sit in my room and watch other kids playing. You know, having appropriate, age-appropriate friends and going places. We were not allowed to do any of that. We were beaten if we tried to bring friends over. Um, if we dare snuck around or anything like that. So, um... But yeah, around the age of 12, I started getting wild. I started making friends at the junior high school. And I made friends with a girl that was almost 17 years old. She was really grown for her age and still in junior high. And that's the first thing I did was gravitate towards the older, wiser people. You know, that's what I thought was cool at the time. I didn't have any time for these little kids. I was already so fucking grown in the mind. Because of what had been happening to me. I'd been drinking alcohol for two or three years. I'd been having all these things done to me. And, you know, so I didn't look at little kids. No, I gravitated towards the older people. And, um, you know, she started talking to me about running away from home. So I started thinking about things. And, you know, it was really like I just woke up at 12 years old and I was like, fuck these people. Fuck these people. They're ridiculous. And all this has been going on with me, this big dysfunctional, violent, abusive, sexually abusive, corrupt-ass family. One minute you're saying, here, drink this. You don't have to go to school, blah, blah, blah. Let's get drunk, blah, blah, blah. You're doing all these things to me. And the next minute, you're beating my ass, telling me I got to get up and go to school. All these fucking mixed messages. Fuck you, people. I'm out of here. And that's all I cared about. I was only 12. I was like a baby. But I've got pictures I'm going to include in the video, at least one picture, of what I look like at that age. Boy, I thought I was tough. I had my leather glove and my jacket. I was a very expressive child. Very, I was fierce about my personality because my father took so much from me. He smothered and controlled me so much. I was so fierce about having a personality and being able to express myself. But I had that look, even as a little girl, just defiant, just fuck you people. This isn't me. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm getting the fuck out of here. And I spent a lot of years like that um, in the streets and running away and, and different stuff like that. But anyway, you know, so I had something else about me. And there were other kids at home. And at that age, I couldn't do much about it. I was screwed up myself. I was just a kid, a baby, really. I was so screwed up, there wasn't much I could do about it at the time. But, yeah, I knew there was something different about me. I was one of those kids that <sighs> I had a spiritual side. I had a, a rich imagination. Even though I was being smothered and controlled and isolated and I was lonely and I couldn't be like other kids, I still loved being in my room. I made the best of it. I had a great imagination. I created. I wrote songs. I daydreamed. I made plans. I had a very rich inner life, and a lot of trauma kids do. Abused kids do. They live in their head a lot. A lot of them have fantasies of being rock stars, of being superheroes. Yes, that's very common in abused and traumatized kids because there's something that's being taken from us. There's some some attention we're not getting or abuse is happening. We want to do something. It's some of that psychology. Yes, I understand that very well. And part of that was there with me too. I wanted a lot of that. But also I understand that a lot of that was just real. I was talented. I was creative. I had a great imagination. Um, and I was born highly spiritual like that. I was empathic almost to the point of being psychic. I could feel my guides. 
I could tap into that intuition. And it's what kept me alive in the streets at 12. Even though I ran into some really bad things that I'll have to get into in another video. Um, there were times, there was a time I was raped at knife point. I was raped a couple of times when I was running away and out in the streets. But it could have been far, far worse. They could have found my body in a fucking dumpster as a 12-year-old girl in some of the awful places I was lingering around and hitchhiking. And I had to be smart. I had to be quick. I had to read energy. And I still got fucked up sometimes, but not nearly. I can honestly say some of the most graphic, horrific, brutal, somehow my angels protected me from that. Okay, but some bad things did happen to me, and I'll go into that in a second video, because um, I'm probably not even going to be able to, what time is it? Probably, yeah, I'm at 30 minutes, this is going to get too long, so I'm probably going to have to finish it in a part two. But I just wanted to get started getting part of this story up for the channel, because I talk about a lot of psychological things here, abuse issues, survival, surviving those types of things, relationships, um, and how our childhoods can factor into our relationships. I do, I do have other topics here that don't even relate to any of that, but, you know, I wanted to go ahead and get part of this story up. So, yeah, when I hit 12, I'm like, all right, fuck you people, I'm getting out of here. And... <clears throat> I started running away from home. I, um, and they would always come after me. My dad would come after me, drag me back to the house. They would file petitions on me. The courts would put me in different places, and I'd always end up either back at home or whatever, run, 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 um, behavioral institutions, foster cares. I was in a lot of shit. Um, 